morning. Morning.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June Staff Senate meeting for UTRGV Staff Senate. Uh, as it is now 9.01, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, may you may proceed with the roll call. Thank you, Madam President. Senators, please indicate your attendance by putting that in the chat as your name is called. Nolan Lasos, Laura Ramos, Claudia Dole Morrison, Alberto Adame, Karen Dorado, Rogelio Chanez, Kevin Garza, Nick Deberly, Karina Herrera, Nicole English, Nayeli Garcia, Ashley Mercado, Juan Santos Flores, Maria Juarez Serna, Orlando Castaneda, Tammy Munoz, Veronica Villarreal, Armando Garza, Matthew Pollock, Marissa Camperano, Kelly Quinn, Millie Resendez, Cordelia Raza, Teresa Villarreal, Irene Cardenas, Andres Chavez, Yadira Mejia, Caitlin Brousseff, and Jacob Camacho. Thank you, Senators. Madam President, quorum has been established. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of my fellow staff senators, thank you for joining us this morning. Believe it or not, we are halfway through 2021. As always, it is a delight to see all of you in your designated box. And I'm very much looking forward to when we get to see each other in person. Our first order of business this morning is the approval of our May meeting minutes. Madam Secretary, can you please make a motion? I would like to make a motion to go ahead and table that until our next meeting. Okay, motion has been made. Anyone second? Second. Did someone second? Was that you, Matt? Yes, it's always me. Okay, Matthew second. Okay, any debate or discussion? Any debate or discussion? Any debate or discussion? Staff senators, those in favor? Raise your, uh, do your thumbs up, say aye. Unmute yourself. Aye. And, aye. Yeah, and those that oppose, say nay. Okay, motion carried. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, during this time a year ago, while most of us were adjusting to remote work, some units were making adjustments to their operations and how to keep it open safely. Among those units is our University Recreation Center. We are pleased that they've accepted our invitation to join us this morning and share with us what they have been up to in the past year, as well as some exciting updates that they have in store for our students, as well as for us staff members. Faye Kanan is our fitness and wellness coordinator, as well as my fellow wellness champion. I think she's here in the room. Thanks again for joining us this morning, Ms. Faye. The floor is yours. Thank you, Noeline. And yes, there has been a lot of updates during um, these times. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us this morning. Um, today, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Kimberly Rotet, Director of University Recreation for the last four years. Under her guidance, we have been able to continue providing students and UREC members with high quality programming and services. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rotet. Many thank you, uh, Ms. Faye, and uh, kudos to Faye and all of our University of Recreation team if they are on the call, hopefully um, uh, certainly deserving of, of some recognition for all the hard work they've done this last year and an incredible pivot to switch from in-person to virtual, as well as when we were asked to reopen um, at the time, which was at the height of the pandemic, and just absolute kudos to our team. Uh, thank you for having us here this morning. We're, we're very appreciative. I'd like to uh, share my screen if I could, just have a a few, uh, less, than, uh, less than a few slides to share with you in terms of what we have going on currently with, uh, within University Recreation. Are you all able to see the slide? I hope so, yes, awesome. So let's see here. Um, just real quick, some facilities updates and you can still see the, the right-hand side of the slide uh, is a picture that still represents 
what our what our facility looks like currently. Uh, we were able to come back and reopen on June 1st. We emphasize very much uh, 10 feet of social distancing, not just the six feet when you're exercising and breathing harder and heavier, you're pushing that air further. We, we, we took a, a page from a lot of our colleagues across the state and the country as well. The height of the pandemic, um, as everything was starting, uh, we have what's called the Salado Consortium, which is uh, all of the Texas Collegiate Recreation Directors getting together uh, on a call regularly once a month, even pre-COVID. We, we, we switched that to do about every week uh, for a long time, and then we're now at about every two to three weeks as we hopefully near the end uh, or come closer to, to wrapping up um, what some of our day-to-day -day continual changes look like at, you know, with COVID in mind. But this is still uh, very, uh, very true to what our facility looks like. We are still working very hard to provide some social distancing, uh, working with the university task force to help ensure that our patrons are still uh, staying at minimum 10 feet apart. Uh, we're trying to, you know, you know, reduce uh, a lot of the group gathering just as much as we can within the building and, and, and asking folks to be respectful of that. But we have, over the course of the last few months, been able to open up some additional amenities with some new stuff opening up on June 1st. So initially when we opened, it was very much just informal recreation. There weren't necessarily uh, in-person programs occurring. A lot of our programs, all of our programs, in fact, transitioned to the virtual environment, uh, whether that be from the Zoom uh, group fitness classes to some outdoor adventure digital engagement in terms of you know, asking our outdoor staff to become essentially professional YouTubers uh, in, in a lot, like teaching, you know, various types of skills and putting together material in that regard. With the hours of operation, though, uh, we have recently, if you were with us uh, through last summer to, you know, the course of the school year, we were open for one hour blocks, and then we would close for an hour to do disinfect. And I you know, yes, we're always cleaning. That was even something pre-COVID. We take a lot of pride in how clean our building is pre Dr. Rotet, you got think, muted. Yeah, I think it well. muted. I don't know how that happened, but um, we're, we were still very much cleaning, uh, very much doing a, a lot of cleaning when everybody was in the building, but actually closing 30 minutes for sanitation. So there's a difference between the two uh, and allowing some wet cure time for our hospital grade uh, cleaner to kind of uh, go to work uh, during, during the sanitation time. June 1st, we started to, we were able to expand our hours of operation for three hour chunks of time. We, are, we do still close at, after that three hour mark and we're still sanitizing the entire building with our hydrostatic sprayers. Those th things take about three minutes of a wet cure, three to five minutes of a wet cure so we can get through the entire building and have it sanitized in, in anticipation of the next three hour uh, block of time starting. Reservations are still required. This is our way of um, monitoring um, capacity to a certain extent. We do still have some capacity uh, limitations. We're, we're currently operating at 50% capacity. There have been, when we were operating at 25, uh, we, were, we were hitting our, our capacity point very close to it a couple of times a day. There are definitely still um, hours of operation where, the, you know, where uh, our patrons are still uh, choosing to, for, for peak workout times, and that still holds true. But we're up to three hours now, 50% capacity. So we're able to take on a few more folks as additional amenities have opened. We can open the racquetball courts now for an individual to be in there. Um, we're able to open up some of the table tennis and the badminton, some of those one-on-one -on -one type of activities where we're still able to, uh, to you know, pay attention to social distancing and, and still help monitor uh, th those, those um, you know, patrons in, in that setting. With, uh, with, some of the opportunities uh, that we have been able to reopen, we're still, um, anything team sports related, we're still not able to do team sports uh, items. And we can jump to that with our programming updates uh, slide. Uh, this particular picture here on this slide is the summer group fitness schedule. Uh, hopefully what you guys notice and something we've, we want, we can provide a reminder about, but we're very excited to have some um, in-person uh, classes on the Brownsville campus. Uh, please recall that that TSC building is not our building to program freely within. Um, we pay the TSC uh, staff over there essentially monies for our, our UTRGV students to be allowed to utilize that facility uh, because of who it is and, you know, laws in, in terms of certain things in terms of who can use the space. So we're not always able to program as freely as we would like. But what we have done uh, is, is work with some of our, uh, our fitness instructors to be able to offer some classes on the Brownsville campus 
uh, in person. So we have a hybrid approach with our group fitness schedule for the summer. Uh, we do anticipate even as we move towards quote unquote normalcy and whatever that might mean, and it's going to be new normal for us. Um, we, we're still going to have some hybrid, uh, some, some digital programs in, in a hybrid format. If something good came out of COVID for university recreation, the immediate shift to the digital format allowed us to reach our distance learning students. They had never been truly catered to, uh, at least from our department. That was something that was always on our radar. How do we do, how do we make it work and how do we balance this? C COVID forced our hand and we had to figure it out and figure it out quickly. Uh, and again, just kudos to the to the team for doing that. And we're still figuring out what's going to keep, you know, and remain digital in that in that platform so that we can continue to serve those students uh, with a lot of different things. Faye is working uh, with like on a, essentially a like a fitness uh, on demand type of, of platform. And as that kind of is our um you know, our, our trial run, hoping to expand that to more of a programs and overall services uh, digital platform, like a, an on-demand thing. I uh, hope that's kind of where our brain is going with this. So there still will be some digital engagement, e-gaming, e fitness, um, camp programming. We, we're very, you see virtual uh, youth rec camp there is what's going on this summer with the keeping in mind the social distancing requirements in, this, in the capacity uh, elements that we do need to, to make sure that we uh, are adhere to. We weren't really able to feasibly come up with a plan that was servicing uh, you know, a lot of students or, you know, or um, uh, campers in that regard for the youth pro, uh, recreation uh, program. This was, was a, this was a hard, hard one for us to swallow. That's, that's one of our pride and joy programs. We love putting it on every year. Uh, but with the uh, continued social distancing and making sure that we're kind of doing our part to keep everybody away from each other, but together, but far away from each other in a safe manner, um, that was that was too difficult for, uh, for us to do when we think about the numbers that we normally get at summer camp. But we have some other things going on this summer, just uh, fitness challenges. One of the examples is just sun's out, guns out. You know, they had uh, one over the spring semester, like, are you tougher than a climber and kind of like a grip challenge. So our fitness team and our outdoor adventure team uh, teaming together in that regard for an awful lot of collaboration. Uh, the, we mentioned uh, the, the hybrid group exercise program, really, really excited about that. We're happy to see people coming back into the facility, working out, but at the very same time that that's going on, people will still be able to join these Zoom classes. So really, really exciting to see how, that, how that's going. And that has started and is underway. Um, and, we're, and we're figuring out how we can continue to do that and continue to improve that experience. So that's something we know to a certain extent we wanna keep in, in the future. Intramural sports, uh, we do have some summer activity plans. So we are, I guess in early spring, we were approved to do singles in-person sports. So really the guidance is let's take these COVID parameters for, uh, from the institution and, you know, we are recreation professionals. We create play for a living. It's what we do. We're the folks that drive to a concert with a lot of stuff in our trunk and we're making a game out of it as we're sitting on the lawn. Like that's what we do. So it, it was this mentality of what, how can we modify these traditional activities to still be able to offer something within the parameters of what's going to help keep our community safe. Uh, we still have very much have that mindset when we're thinking about intramural sports and what we can do. There's a, a lot of cleaning practices that are still going on, uh, even for like softball, like the first true team sport. We're able to do that, but we're able to, to do that in a way where we're still maintaining social distancing and a lot of those cleaning parameters. So a lot of really uh, hopefully fun new things coming out uh, for, for our patrons you know, and, and students. Wellness on their personal training. Um, Again, so who knew who knew that digital personal training was going to be something people really, you know, really, really liked um, kind of the pinch hit thing in the moment when you need to do it. But some people can, you know, at, you know, continuing to go on with their personal trainer so they can still do that at home and have our what a great opportunity for our student personal trainers to um, kind of switch their mindset and work with what folks might have in home, but still helping them along their wellness journeys. So now kind of coming back and thinking about how we can successfully make that a true hybrid program, you know, even into the future. Uh, so certainly some very exciting things going on uh, when it comes to, to, to our programming areas. Oops, sorry. Looking ahead, um, thinking about whatever that new normal means for us, um, when we, you know, certainly anticipating um, kind of getting back to what that is, but we are, we are very cognizant of the fact that normal is not going to be the same 
post-COVID as it was pre-COVID. Uh, you know, the, what's going to remain a digital option? What's going to work really well in that platform and in that space? Um, what will people continue to gravitate towards within that digital realm? The other thing from a facilities perspective, looking at traffic patterns, you know, recognizing that, yes, we definitely had our traffic patterns during COVID in terms of peak, uh, peak time, change is hard. We recognize that. And if, you know, maybe folks went elsewhere um, during, you know, if, if another gym happened to open before us, I think May 18th was the, was the day in 2020 that the governor said gyms could open and we were we weren't the first in the uh, collegiate recreation department in the state to open, but we were within the top four um, within to open a couple, like three other schools went before us, two on May 18th and two of uh, one a few days later. And then, you know, and then we uh, went on, on June 1st to open on the Edinburgh campus. We, you know, again, kind of keeping in mind with our with our with our colleagues in the shared space on the Brownsville campus. They're not necessarily at that three hour block mark and then the cleaning rotation. They're still at the one hour and the cleaning rotation. So doing what we can to communicate those um, differences you know, with, with our students and our patrons is something that it definitely is on our radar, but how is that gonna change? Will people come back to the gym? Are, are, are there still some apprehensions about cleanliness? And if we can alleviate some of those, um, maybe just take a take a quick walk through our building and, and still recognize that even during that three hour block that we're open, how often our students are cleaning. And even to a point of grabbing the hydrostatic sprayers that we, you know, that with that three to five minutes of wet cure time, there might be a piece of equipment that somebody uses and cleans off. Our staff can go spray that and somebody might not be on it for the next three to five minutes. And that piece is still sanitized. Just the, the consistent cleaning um, and sanitation that's going on within our space. And, and hopefully some of those concerns would, would be alleviated. The other thing that we're doing, uh, recognizing that normal is going to be different inevitably when we get back. What does that mean for us in terms of what we can continue to do? And the avenue that we have chosen is to continue to seek out campus partnerships in terms of collaborations. Vaquero Olympics for, for the, this is the summer um, opportunity with that. Um, we've also had some conversations with the counseling center and adventure therapy and how, you know, getting back into um, everyday life post, you know, post uh, COVID return. Like there, there's a lot of discussion going on in terms of some campus partnerships. And, and those are certainly some things that we can, you know, are going to continue to look for uh, and, and, and want to embrace it if folks are wanting to, to do some partner programming with us on campus. That does kind of very hopefully kind of quickly sum up what we've been up to for the last year, as well as give you some insight into what to look forward to. But if you have questions now, uh, certainly we, uh, I think several staff members are on the call, we could take it or you could reach out uh, and we'll certainly be able to assist you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rotet, for that very helpful information. And, you know, I've always been amazed that your team keeping the URIC open, following all the protocols and being able to adjust to it and, you know, keep us, give us access to be active and, and be healthy um, at the same time. I just want to make sure that the URIC is also accessible to staff and faculty. Am I correct? Absolutely. So it is accessible to uh, faculty and staff. Uh, there are some state laws uh, because it is a student fee funded facility, uh, student, you know, faculty and staff do need to pay at least what the students pay uh, in terms of the, the fee. Uh, but when I when I take it, you, you can do a monthly deduction. And I believe when you do a monthly deduction over the course of 12 months, it's less than $25 a, a month that's coming out of our, that's automatically being deducted from my paycheck. I think it's actually around 22. Wow, that's a good deal. It is a good deal. <laughs> Wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Rotet or any of her staff from our URAC? I would like to add just a, a quick side note for those that are coming in for in-person programming. Uh, for example, for our in-person group fitness classes, they need, do need to register for, for it through IM Leagues. So that's also if to reserve a space on the fitness floor or on the cardio section as well. Oops. And the outdoor pool has been reopened. Correct. That is correct. So with the outdoor pool, uh, we, we, the outdoor pool was one we, we were a little bit, uh, was a little bit tricky. Um, think about the, the high levels of chlorine. We're swimming in disinfectant when we get in, in, into the pool. But again, with some state laws, because of the type of pool that it is, it required a bathhouse, quote unquote, a bathhouse or shower services. And at, at, at a certain time uh, throughout the course of the academic year, we, 
we, we couldn't we couldn't get the showers uh, open as a part of what was approved through the university just because of the amount of cleaning that would still need to be uh, need to be done. Um, so when we were able to say, well, we're, we're now receiving more foot traffic, we can still block off certain showers. The locker rooms are open. Day use lockers are, are back as well as the uh, locker services. So you can bring your stuff in um, and actually like pay to have a locker throughout the course of the semester. What, how that happens is that we still go through and we still clean uh, every rotation that we have. We've also put a lot of our, um, it's, uh, it's the, the Rejuvenol, it's a hospital grade product for, for cleaning in terms of the showers and have some bottles essentially there for, we are asking patrons to play a part in the cleaning. Like, so spray it down before you get in, spray it down when you get out, and then we're gonna follow you and do it again with the sanitation process. So everybody can kind of uh, hopefully understand how, how that works. But yes, the, the pool is, is linked to, by state law, um, shower services. Thank you. And I believe, Faye, you've shared some files on the chat. Yes, I, I shared uh, some membership information as well as our group fitness classes. Awesome. You all are very busy. <laughs> Once again, thank you, Faye, Dr. Rotet, and your team for joining us this morning. And hopefully you will see more of us in the Wellness um, Recreation Center. We certainly hope so. Come visit us for sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is no stranger to any of us. So really, he does not need an introduction. I believe he's already in the room. Dr. Bailey, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks so much. I, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for everything you've done over the last uh, uh, more than a year now, so about 15, 14, 15 months. And uh, it has been a, an interesting and difficult time for uh, for everyone. I, I told someone a couple of years ago that I'd been in higher education a long time and I had seen everything. That was not true. I had not seen a pandemic and had not seen the effects of it. So just like you were, I was trying to figure all of this out. And uh, uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, during the pandemic year, we had a, a very successful year. And it, when I when other people look at our numbers and when I talk to other people about what's happened at UTRGV, they're stunned. <clears throat> Remember, uh, enrollment uh, dropped significantly at most universities. In fact, I just read something today, higher education as a whole lost 600,000 students between this spring and last spring. Think about that, 600,000 students. That's a lot of students. We had an increase in enrollment. Our, our fall and springs were, and last summer too, were all record enrollments. And <clears throat> that really is a tribute to the hard work that all of you did. And so uh, I wanna tell you how much I appreciate that. <clears throat> our, our finance team and, and our administrative team as a whole did a very good job of planning. When, this, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had already anticipated that. I mean, you read the newspapers and you, you see what's going on. And so <clears throat> we had already got together and made some plans. We understood, uh, and, and uh, again, uh, I had listened to the, uh, uh, to the on, on, you know, when you're driving, you listen to books. I listened to one on the 1918-19 Spanish flu. And so I understood that the, the, economic consequences would be pretty severe as well. And so we made a decision <clears throat> that we would do some things like put a hiring freeze on, we restrict track, did, did a whole bunch of, of things like that. And as a result, we were able to get through the entire pandemic with no layoffs, uh, no furloughs, <clears throat> no one was let go because of the pandemic. And uh, that was crucially important to us. And remember last year, we gave back 10% uh, of our state appropriation. So, uh, but we kept working, we kept building our enrollment, we kept doing the right things, and it really has paid off for us. As most of you know, we've just finished a legislative session. That session, <clears throat> which in the, the legislature provided no new money, they sustained the, the, uh, 10% budget cuts 
which higher education didn't do it. The one thing they did do was fund enrollment growth. <clears throat> because we had done a very good job of growing our enrollment. And, and if some of you who were around in 2017, remember we had a terrible legislative session. I went around doing presentations, telling you what we needed to do to improve that situation. Well, all of you did that. All of you worked with us and, and we were able to do it. And so as a consequence, even though the legislature added no new money, sustained the 10%, they only funded the enrollment growth. <clears throat> we had the best legislative session we've ever had. And uh, that's really quite remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> and so we're gonna have some new revenues, some new state appropriations next year. And what we're gonna try to do, uh, all of the new money that's coming in, we're going to plow directly back into our people. And uh, our, our people are what's got us where we are. And so we, we want to, uh, to ensure that we sustain that going forward. Uh, <clears throat> so a, a couple of things, I'm, and I'm just gonna give you a preview. What you should keep in mind, everything I tell you has to be approved by the Board of Regents at the August meeting, okay? And so <clears throat> we're going, we're making the assumption right now that the board will approve <clears throat> the plan that I'm gonna lay out for you. Okay, does that make sense? So don't quote me on this yet, right? Wait, wait until August <laughs> and I'll send a campus letter out with this big caveat. Uh, don't, don't quote me yet, <clears throat> but we, we do, here's what we plan to do with the money. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it, it's all gonna go right back into our employees. First thing we're gonna do, we, and I'm gonna talk about staff in particular. We, we have similar things we'll do with faculty and I'll, I'll tell the faculty senate about that, but I'm gonna focus on staff right now. There are essentially three pots of, new, of money that we're going to put into salaries. And so, and by the way, almost all of the new revenue that comes in will go into salaries and some new employees. We'll do some new hiring too. So, but the first thing we're gonna do, <clears throat> the first, we intend to set aside money, a pool of money for a 2% merit raise. And so, uh, and we, we want that to be effective in September rather than December. And so, uh, <clears throat> again, this all hinges, remember, on Board of Regents approval. Got, got me? <laughs> okay. But, but so there, there'll be a merit raise. The second thing, we've got a pool of money, which is probably larger, it is actually larger than 2%. Which will uh, we're calling kind of equity compression money, but what that will do, <clears throat> it will get our entire workforce <clears throat> up to at least twenty five percent of the market value. It's I'm embarrassed to say that there are people below that. Our goal is to get everyone eventually to the at least to the median, the fifty percent. Now that's a multi year <clears throat> in, in, in multi uh, biennial session goal. But that, that's what we plan to do. And so this is the first step in doing that. The, the last thing we plan to do, we, there's another pool of money set aside. Our, our lowest paid employees, uh, <clears throat> minimum wage employees, uh, many of whom, by the way, did not have options of working at home, right? If you're a custodian, uh, if you, you know, worked in facilities, if you, if you, many of those people had to be on campus to do the cleaning and so forth. Uh, so what we're gonna do is raise all those employees to at least $13 an hour. That will be the floor at UTRGB. And so uh, <clears throat> we, we think that, that this is the least we can do. But if we do that, this is a significant investment uh, uh, in, in, our, in, in our people at UTRGV, the people that make us work. And so three pots of money <clears throat> for staff. Uh, one pot gets that minimum wage up to the, the lowest paid employees up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, no less than $13 an hour. And so that'll be, uh, everybody here will, will make at least that. And then another pot of equity money, which will get everybody up, uh, to the 20th percent, 25th percentile, I'm sorry, or above, and then merit money on top of that. 
starting in September rather than December. This is not because we had a good legislative session. This isn't you remember that we, we've given pay raises in the past, but they've been contingent on enrollment growth. So we couldn't do that until December, you understand. So that's that's what we're doing here. We have a parallel pot of money for faculty. <clears throat> so that's part of it. The second thing, <clears throat> we didn't do some hiring, right? We had a hiring freeze on and we'd had a hiring freeze on more or less a soft hiring freeze since 2017 <clears throat> because of the, the disastrous legislative session we had then. And so we'll do uh, hiring in selective areas. I've asked the vice presidents to be very selective. And uh, <clears throat> and again, as we build our workforce, this will be a multi-year thing, but in certain areas in particular, we, <clears throat> we have severe shortages. And so we'll try to, uh, to uh, do something about that. Um, and so we, it's it's a good legislative session. We're we're putting the we'll restore travel. We we fr frozen travel money. I mean, we'll restore that. So uh, and so those are the things we're doing. We're putting the money back into our people. It was as I said, a very good legislative session. <clears throat> and as a result, our future has never been brighter than it is right now. We we come out of this awful year. And I don't know how else you describe it. It was not fun for anybody. Uh, we come out of this awful year in the best position we've ever been <clears throat> and with the best trajectory for a future. So I, I know it's tough and I know the last few years have been tough because <clears throat> you know we as you know, we form a new university and we had some financial issues in both of the legacies and then <clears throat> that legislative session. But what we've done, we've done all the right things and we're really headed in the right direction. So we have a very good future ahead of us. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be happy to answer any questions about that if you'd like. Uh, I should, before I do that though, I, you know, I, I, if you have not been vaccinated, please do so. Be, make sure your family is vaccinated, <clears throat> everybody who's eligible and, and the, the age limit keeps going down. <clears throat> now most people, if, if you look around the country and the state, uh, first of all, the Valley has done much better than the rest of the state of Texas. I mean, we, we, we're ahead of the state of Texas in vaccination. So that's something to be proud of. People who are older around the country have been vaccinated at very high rates. <clears throat> if you look at people uh, over 50, the vast, you know, most of those people are, are getting vaccinated. Under 50, not, you know, not quite so much. Remember, it's not going to cost you anything. We want you to be vaccinated. We want our students to be vaccinated. So please get the vaccine. We need to begin starting back to work face-to-face. Uh, -face. We'll phase this in gradually. By the fall, uh, we'll, we'll be mostly uh, back face-to-face. -face. This is important, and it's important for our students. If, if you look at the data we had, our experienced students, people who are juniors, seniors, most sophomores, people who had gone to college <clears throat> were able to make the adjustment to remote learning without too much trouble. Uh, and not that they liked it, not that they were having fun, but, but they, you know, they know what college requires. And so they made the adjustment. Last year was a disaster for freshmen. <clears throat> it, it really was. Th they had no experience in college, they didn't have face-to-face -face <clears throat> access to the resources that could have helped them. And so we know that, especially for students coming in uh, and, and for many of our continuing students, this is absolutely, it, it's a necessity. It's not really a, an option. And so uh, please be vaccinated. That vaccination will, will uh, uh, come as close as you can ever get to ensuring your safety. I, I, I was a little boy when there was polio epidemic in the United States and your parents <clears throat> wouldn't let you go to the movie theaters or, I mean, you couldn't go to parks, you couldn't go to swimming pools. Everyone in polio affected kids mostly, unlike uh, COVID-19, which you know, was, was worse on older adults. But uh, once that vaccine hit, we got back to normal. 
And you know that again, is it a hundred percent guarantee? No, there are no hundred percent guarantees, but it's as close as you can you can get. And and all of us who got that polio vaccine are very appreciative we could live normal lives after that. And with the COVID vaccine, uh, you're going to be able to do pretty much the same thing. So uh, anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about that or anything else. I am opening up the floor to anybody that has a question for Dr. Bailey. Oh. Everybody. I have no questions. I just want to thank you for that bright light. Uh, hopefully August will come around. Everybody will be in agreement and we'll get those races. And that's really good news for those of us that have been working through the pandemic. And um, thank you for uh, your dedication to keeping us all employed and not getting rid of any of us as we all need it. You know, my, need my, you. yeah, my wife, my wife actually at her own job had to actually take a step down, pay cut and everything, or uh, <clears throat> decide to be laid off and she chose to stay. So I'm glad I didn't have to make that choice. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for your hard work. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's our hard work and all of us working together. So. Good morning, Dr. Bailey. Um, I have a question regarding the immunization. Uh, yeah. What happens if we don't want to receive it? Are we able to go back to work? Sure. That's your personal choice. <clears throat> and there may be some people who can't be vaccinated. We understand that the, the, the fact that most other people will be vaccinated will help you there. But, but whether you receive a vaccination is your choice. This is not a, we don't do vaccine mandates. We, we, we couldn't legally if we wanted to, but we understand that there are issues <clears throat> out there. But yes, you can, if, you, if you're not vaccinated, you certainly can go back to work, absolutely. But is there like a, a something, uh, is there gonna be uh, maybe a mask that we still need to wear or maybe stay we, away from people around us or how, do you have that in plan yet? We, well, we don't have firm plans about that yet, but there, there, we, we will encourage masks. By law, we can't require them. And uh, <clears throat> just as we can't require the vaccines, we can't require the mask either. However, uh, you know, I, we'd encourage that as, in, indoors in particular. If you, if you look at the science, and again, we rely heavily on the science here. Uh, first of all, if you're vaccinated, you're highly unlikely to get it. And if you get it, it's, you're probably not gonna notice it. It's just, uh, <clears throat> again, the effectiveness rates of the vaccines that we've been giving on campus are very high. And so that's, <clears throat> that's a, the, uh, uh, the first thing. Uh, and again, the the mask uh that's pretty much a personal that that will be a personal choice but what the science says is that outdoors this doesn't really spread very much you're pretty safe even if you're not vaccinated indoors they do recommend the mask uh this is a this is an airborne spread virus uh it you know relatively close contact. So if you're indoors and you've not been vaccinated, I would absolutely try to wear a mask and we'll encourage that. But again, uh, you know, these are personal choices you make. Once, once we are through the emergency, it becomes an issue of personal choice just with, as with anything else. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. And thank you for, for your leadership, yours and your executive team. Um, I think we're doing great, as you mentioned, and I really appreciate everything you're doing. I do have a question also related to the vaccine. Um, what is the protocol for coming back to campus uh, if we have employees that are still concerned um, and want to stay home? Uh, do How do we how do we move forward with that if we want our employees to come back because we have students coming back, but they have concerns, are they allowed to stay home or do we need to ask them to come back to campus? How, how does, how's that gonna work? 
Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. You again, you you should work through your vice, the, the appropriate vice president here. But yes, you are going to probably have to ask those employees to come back to work at some point. <clears throat> we have to we have to return to normal, just as we did with polio. And uh, at, at some and there were probably people back then who didn't get vaccines or who were scared. To, but you know, it, at some point, you had to you had to move back to normal. And so, uh, yes, it. It, it, again, remember, we can't function if we don't serve our students. We, we, we don't have a, we have no role. I mean, that's, that's the only reason we exist. And so uh, we did the best we could during the pandemic, but it was not the best. I mean, that, and I mentioned, if, if you look at the success rates of our, our freshmen, they were terrible. And I mean, I've never seen anything quite like it. And, a long, long career. And so uh, we do need to get back to face to face. And, and so you, you will have to ask your employees to do that. And again, uh, if you're vaccinated, you're in good shape. I mean, the, the science is very clear on that. And so, and, and we, we have gone long enough and have enough data now <clears throat> that that safety is there. If, uh, other things are personal choices that you have to make. And you just have to weigh benefits with uh, with risk. Hi, I have a question, Dr. Thank Bailey, um, and that's um, on the heels of this question that you were just asked. Um, God willing, we continue to have, see numbers decline when it comes to COVID, and just as much as we're looking forward to reopening, I know that school districts are as well. Um, should something unforeseen happen where uh, virtual learning has to make a comeback for the kids? Uh, will there, uh, is that something that you guys are keeping an eye on so that, yeah. um, you know, working parents can have an option again? Sure. We, we monitor uh, all the time <clears throat> what's going on. We try, remember our medical school has been a key here in helping us monitor the progress of the disease, the progress of vaccines and, and all of this. So we keep an eye on that. We follow CDC guidelines very carefully. Uh, on a constant basis. And we have, we have a committee on campus that is devoted to that, a working group that <clears throat> is devoted to, to, you know, we can't guarantee that the pandemic won't break out or something else won't happen. Well, again, we would make whatever adjustments we had to make as a campus. But I think right now, most school districts will be face-to-face. -face. I think, I think uh, by the time we get to the fall, most everything will be back to, uh, to normal. Uh, it, it, does that mean COVID-19 goes away? No, and polio hasn't, doesn't go away, but what you, you, you do, uh, you have such minimal risk that uh, most people are affected. Sir, do you have anything to say about the um, daycare situation? Because I know I personally have a coworker who, um, she is better off working at home right now until daycare is open because she's got a toddler and her husband also works full time. So for her, I know it would be impossible to come back to the office without the daycare support. You, you can. Are you talking about daycare at the university or general daycare? No, at the university, because she uses the one that's there on campus in Edinburgh. Yeah, we're working on plans right now to get that uh, underway as well. So and, and again, there will be individual circumstances where you need to work with your supervisor and, and your supervisor and the appropriate vice president, they have the leeway to, to do what they need to do to ensure, uh, you know, we, we get our jobs done and that, that people are able to, uh, to work in a safe and secure manner. Other questions? There's a question here. Yes, it says, hi, Dr. Bailey, the equity in compression for the 25% percentile is related to the phase three implementation, staff salaries based on experience and education for each employee. I'm not you know, <clears throat> you know I, I, on the details of this, I'd rather have Mike James address it. I think Mike 
can probably do a better, I mean, when you get to the details of it, he will have a better sense of exactly what this means. So if, if you have Mike at this meeting or a later meeting, he can, he'll, he'll get down into the weeds with you. Yeah. Don't believe he's here. I just checked the roster. Thank you. Other questions? Um, good, good morning, Dr. Bailey. This is Liana. And first of all, thank you very much for your leadership. I had a question in regards to retention moving forward. Um, what, what are we doing? She, Liana, you got muted. Sorry about that. Uh, my question is in regards to retention as we move forward. And what is UTRGV doing differently than our sister universities in order to continue to have our students here at UTRGV? And what can we do differently in our own units or departments for that? Can you repeat that question for me? Did, if someone heard it a little better, I, I didn't quite get all the details of the question. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's better. Uh, my question is, um, what are what is UTRGV doing differently than our sisters' universities in order to continue um, keeping retention, and what can we do differently in our units and departments to contribute to retention of our students and enrollment? Uh, <clears throat> no, those are good questions because we did things differently this past year and uh, from what our others did. First of all, the federal stimulus money that we're getting, <clears throat> we devoted almost entirely to students. Uh, and, 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 to, and I'll, let me, uh, tell you a couple of things about this. First of all, remember that uh, we have many students who are DACA students, dreamers, who did not qualify for some of the stimulus relief <clears throat> that was provided directly for students. Uh, we used our own money to take care of those students. And so we gave them the same kind of stimulus uh, that other students were getting uh, out of our own money and it paid off in a big way for us and for them too. <clears throat> so we'll continue, first of all, to make sure that all of our students benefit <clears throat> from the federal dollars uh, that they receive. The second thing we'll do, <clears throat> unlike most universities, when, when they got stimulus money, they looked at areas where they had lost revenue and tried to replace that revenue <clears throat> what we did was, was dig into our financial reserves to do that. And we took the money and devoted it to students. We'll do the same thing going forward. We'll ask ourselves, what do our students need? And how can we use the resources that we have? And we'll have federal stimulus dollars over the next year uh, to help move that forward. So uh, again, it's, it's about what if you take care of your students first, and, and a, a big part of it was finance, as someone mentioned about a spouse either having to lose her job or <clears throat> take a reduced pay. That's very common. So many people, and, and when you had students, even if they didn't lose the job, their job at Whataburger, their, their parents lost a job. And so they needed additional financial support. So we, we tried to look very carefully at what students would need. Remember when we put a hiring freeze on, the one thing that that did not affect was student workers. <clears throat> so we had a lot of student workers working remotely as well. And we actually added student workers during the pandemic because we, knew, but if you take care of them first, everything else falls into place. And so keep that in mind, <clears throat> any support your units can provide for students, whether it's hiring student workers, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it is uh, uh, providing, you know, a, a advising uh, additional support. Uh, you know, students often don't know how to navigate the university. Anything that you can help them with, it's, it's very difficult. If I was a first generation student, I walked on campus. I, I didn't even know there was financial aid. I, mean, I didn't know anything. And so uh, students, many students will be like that. Provide them assistance, support, uh, when you can employ them, employ them. 
all of those things, if we take care of them first, everything else will fall in place. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, Dr. Bailey, once thank you again, so much. Thank you so I look much forward for to being you. here. Yes, and we will be thinking of you in August and sending you good vibes as you speak with the Board of Regents about <laughs> your plans for us. Well, I'm optimistic, but remember that that has to be done first. So, right. thanks so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir. Be safe. Bye bye. Bye. All righty. Um, now we're going to go ahead and move on to our committee and task force reports. Our, uh, your staff senators and uh, committee chairs have been keeping busy. And I'm going to ask uh, Claudia, the chair of our staff success committee, to go ahead and give us a report, please. Thank you, Noelin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, our committee continue meetings uh, monthly, discussing activities for um, what we can do for um, a staff appreciation. Uh, we have an idea in the works, and this is for um, <clears throat> welcoming uh, staff coming back to campus. Um, so as I said, this is uh, an idea, and we're working on the, the details, and of course, uh, we need to get the approvals for this activity. Can you hear me well? Yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so most likely this will take place in the month of August. So we will let you know and, and if you have any ideas or any recommendations or comments, we would like to hear from you. At the same time, um, <clears throat> I wanna give you an update. Last month um, we have, um, the um, IT presenting um, about the text ambassador. After that presentation, we have um, 55 new employees that joined the group, which is very good. Um, the ambassador uh, tech group that we find in, in Teams, a great opportunity for employees to join as a peer support group. And um, uh, the fact that we are getting more people uh, adding in the group is, is great. It provides good, great opportunities, um, training opportunities, so our staff can um, take um, advantage of these opportunities and learn about any platforms that they need to, um, they need it at their job or professional development. So this is a good opportunity. So from, from last month to this month, we have 55 new members uh, joined to the group. So continue, um, continue um, join and, see the, all the opportunities that are presenting there. Um, more channels can be added um, in, the, in that group, like uh, adding more platforms for people that needs to, um, are interested on in different platforms. With, uh, so far we have Excel, we have uh, um, Acrobat, we have um, Word, uh, Power BI. And also it's very, it's very good that employees are logging to that um, Take uh, the ambassador group uh, to see if there is any more training comments directly um, provided by Microsoft. So I thank uh, Irma Ermida for all the support and IT department for these wonderful opportunities. I think um, our staff should um, visit this uh, group, join this group, and um, take advantage of the peer support um, that it is being provided. Um, so I just want to give an update on that. Um, there are some also, since we're coming back to campus, there are some employees that have not claimed um, uh, the SWACs that they want for uh, staff appreciation. I will, um, uh, since we're coming back to campus, it will be a good opportunity for us to um, contact these employees and you can claim your SWACs for um, when it, once you're back in the offices, we can send them back to your offices or you can claim them in one location that we will let you know ahead of time. Um, our committee continue meetings, as I said, and uh, every month, and we are just looking for opportunities, any event um, that um, we can provide um, opportunities for staff appreciation or any event that um, 
will provide staff opportunities or, or, or just raise awareness of all the wonderful opportunities we have in campus. And then um, and our employees need to take um, advantage of it. Um, we will co uh, keep you posted. Thank you for all um, uh, being uh, present in this meeting and um, pretty much that's uh, my update. And of course, I wanna thank my committee members for their help uh, and their great ideas and their uh, enthusiasm on, on you know, ideas that they present for these activities that we have in plan. So more to come, so stay tuned with that in the next meeting. Thank you, Noelin, and for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Claudia, and thank you again to you and your staff success committee for coming up with ideas and continuing to plan to keep us all engaged and connected and ready uh, to come back uh, face to face and, and as we continue to adjust in this very fluid situation that we're still in. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bring on to the floor our chair for the feedback committee, Ms. Karen Dorado. Thank you, Ms. Madam President. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. The feedback committee encourages our UTRG staff to continue to use the feedback form to submit feedback or ideas regarding UTRG processes, resources, initiatives to promote staff employee success in the workplace. As we receive feedback, our committee reviews that feedback and we work to identify the best way to follow up and address your feedback. The form is available on our UTRG staff center page. And I just saw that Yalita dropped it into the chat box. Um, so feel free to access it through our staff center page and through the link that Yalita just um, shared. And at the moment, we're looking at a few ideas to enhance our feedback form process. They are in the works and we'll be sharing more information soon. And in the meantime, again, we encourage you to partner with us, share your feedback with us. Your feedback is valuable to us to help us promote staff employee success in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm gonna just touch on our elections and constitution committee with Ms. Caitlin. Um, I know we are still in the works on our on the voting for the amendment to the constitution. Uh, go ahead, I will give you the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Again, thank you everyone for being here today. Happy Pride Month. Um, yeah, we're still rolling out what needs to happen for the smoothest voting on these amendments possible. So please just keep an eye on your email as I'm sure you do anyway, if your inbox looks anything like mine. But again, we are working to get that to you and we will let you know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And now we've got Ms. Millie for our communications committee. Good morning, colleagues. Um, for our communications committee, uh, congratulations to our staff senator, Kelly Quinn, representative of our Division of Institutional Advancement, as she is being featured in the staff senate spotlight for this month of June. Also, our upcoming projects, we will be uh, this summer doing the Wellness Wednesday. The committee is currently working on this project and we will be sharing recipes, exercises, and more. Uh, we invite you to follow us on our staff senate social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as we continue our Meme Mondays and our staff senate spotlight postings, as well as the upcoming Wellness Wednesday and selected national date postings. The Staff Senate also now has a YouTube channel and we will be able to view, we have one video congratulating our graduates of class of 2021 video there in our YouTube channel. So I wanna just thank you everyone for being here with us this morning and also to our communications committee members for all their dedication and hard work in making sure we'll be, be able to um, promote or have something to share with you, as well as um, our president and Yadira and all our staff senators for their support. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Millie. And, and we're excited to, for what communications has in store for us. And I know that you'll be collaborating also with our staff success committee. Thank you once again. And now I have I have PJ here on the call this morning. PJ is our liaison 
for the employee advisory board it's like staff senate but at the system level and he's representing us so well on there but he's also heading up one of our task force which is the departmental email task force and pj can you give us an update on the work that you're doing there hi noelle sure thing so um, I'm not quite sure whether I gave an update during our last meeting or whether it was in another meeting, but we're currently working with university marketing and communication. And we started to you know, explore the style guide a little bit. And you know, part of the conversation that came up was us you know, coming up with some potential um, guidelines for departmental emails or some templates for departmental emails and communication and being able to provide that to university marketing and communication so that they can look through that and determine what might be a best fit and um, what might be helpful as they begin to explore, you know, updating our style guide and including this type, um, this type of information in there as well. Right now, the style guide, you know, covers this, but it's just a way to make it a little bit more clear for some of our units who might not be entirely sure um, how to present their signatures when communicating with external agencies, communicating internally or with students when it pertains to use the use of departmental email addresses. Um, so there's more to come there. So that's my update for now. Thank, Thank you. you so much, PJ. Appreciate it. Perfect. And now I'd like to open up the floor to public comments and questions, if that's all right, Noella. Yes, so we can go ahead and do that. Perfect. So now uh, the floor is open for public comment or questions. If anyone has any questions, now is the time. And also, if you have any activities for staff to know about in regards to your units, what you all are doing, this is your opportunity to keep us updated on it and, and let us know, keep us in the loop of things. Um, under the communications uh, piece, I guess if our questions or public comments have to be regarding the agenda, um, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, if you don't feel you can answer it, don't answer it. Um, uh, I've, I work at the Harlingen campus and it's, and I've heard that um, uh, there's a potential for PD to no longer have a presence here on this campus. And we're a little bit concerned uh, about that. And I'm wondering if the staff Senate has heard anything about that because, um, you know, uh, we have a library, for example, that the public uses, it's not a public library, but it is open to the public. And as we start opening our doors again in the fall, the way it's being planned, um, I'm just a, a little concerned that we're not gonna have a PD presence. We're only gonna have the, uh, I forget what they're called, like, like the security. Um, and, you know, yeah, we're near two federal buildings, but the PD there is for the federal buildings, not for us here. So, and we do have staff at the at uh, the Veterans Outpatient Day Center on the third floor and nursing's on our second floor as well here in Harlem. And so I'm just wondering if any of the staff Senate has heard about that or if you can maybe help us inquire into that because we're a little concerned <laughs> about that. Yeah. And I really cannot tell who's talking right now, but thank you for bringing that up. I have not heard any of it. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if any of the staff senators have heard of this, but I do see Amanda uh, on the call and I'm sorry to call you out, Amanda, but she is the, net, the only person I know that, is, that has a close relationship with our PD. Amanda, if, you're, if you can hear me, are, are you able to give us some insights on this? Hey, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm here. I cannot and I won't speak on behalf of the chief. If you all have any concerns, please feel free to reach out. I again, I don't want to speak out of turn. Right. So um, the best thing to do if you do have any concerns is to reach out. Um, who is speaking? And if you'd like, I can also give the information to um, our chief because I can't tell either. I cannot tell. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is Esme Lozano. And okay. With the School of Medicine, and we're at at the Harlingen campus. Yes, I heard the Harlingen. That's we're what hoping I was it's just it's just commentary, maybe like a passing idea, but that is a point of concern for us because we yeah. do have public that stops by um, because we're near the hospital. We're near a lot. Right. Yes, direction. Not that they're violent or anything like that, but we have had an occasional interesting situation, if you will, and mm -hmm. so. Um, 
And plus, you know, we are still a campus. <laughs> we're no, not no. as big yeah. as Brownsville or Edinburgh, but we're a campus nonetheless. So uh, just kind of putting it out there I, as, you know, as our, as our representatives, I just had not, I wasn't aware, maybe you guys had heard something about that uh, as part of the reopening of campuses or things like that. But I appreciate your time and Amanda, yeah. Um, no, I will, what I'll do. Quintana? Quintana. Quintana, okay, I'll yes. find you and I'll send you an email. Yeah, send me an email. And then, like I said, um, I don't want to speak out of turn and I don't want to of course, say of any course. information that's incorrect. So I will get your information to our chiefs so that they can address your concerns. Thank you. Appreciate yes, of course. Yes, ma'am. And ESME, our uh, feedback committee, you've got their ears too. So they will follow up with you on it as well, just so that we make sure we can get that address and we'll have an update. Hopefully we'll get an update about it in July because that is also a, a very legitimate concern. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Any uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is, uh, I go by Carlos, but I work with the uh, HHP department here at the Brownsville campus. And I actually addressed this pre-COVID, and I kind of challenged the staff Senate on this particular issue of employment opportunities. Um, I am in the Brownsville campus, and the, uh, I guess I could say the optics seem to be every time I look for upward mobility opportunities, they're all in Edinburgh. Uh, if a position is closing here in the Brownsville campus, let's say for HR, because I have a bachelor's in uh, business management. So that was initially my first intent was to go into like that type of field. Uh, but in order to get my my feet in the door, well, I mean, thank God Dr. Mata gave me this opportunity. And I'm now, I started off in as an office assistant, now I'm an admin uh, one. And on, there is no opportunity for me to go to like an admin two, unless I move to Edinburgh. And that is not feasible. Uh, if a position closes here in HR, the new position opens up, guess where? Edinburgh. So it's still not feasible. So my challenge to you guys on behalf of the staff is, can you please ask why, if we're all one campus, one team, one fight, I can easily do the same job as HR here in Brownsville or financial aid or any type of job for the whole university here in Brownsville and not have to move to Edinburgh. So that's pretty much it. I need a career. I need a clear career path picture. Uh, as to how I'm going to be able to grow and, and improve my, my, my pay. I don't, I mean, I get stipends, of course, if you earn them and you have to do high level work and through the pandemic, it's kind of hard when you're working from home and to go above and beyond or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, but yes, uh, you're right, Rolando. I could have asked president Bailey on this, uh, but it is a staff Senate. A situation i'm trying to follow chain of command as it is i didn't want to put the man on the spot and you know i am trying to move up not get fired so <laughs> um, give me a break uh so so you know there is a political way to do this and i feel that you guys are the ones that are our voice so i'm, I'm just i'm just trying to challenge you on that i mean don't get me wrong i love where i'm at i love who i work for i love what i do but i also have a family and a home and and I, I, and and then uh, you know I want to move up somehow and and right now there is no clear career path for me other than to leave the department I'm in and then find somewhere else to work if I want to get a pay raise and unfortunately that's in Edinburgh right now and I cannot if I'm going to make only what I make to on gas just to get over there an hour away from here and come back or as it's been uh, suggested get on the 6:30 a.m. shuttle and then get on the 6.30 p.m. shuttle to come back and put in a 12, 13 hour workday in order to move up, that is not feasible for me. So that is the one challenge I have for you guys post COVID is to be a voice and, and just, you know, open up some jobs here in Brownsville so that people can move up. All right. So that's it. Thank you. So Juan, thank you for uh, letting us, um, you know, voicing out your concerns, putting that trust uh, with your staff senators and the staff senate. Um, we do have a, a great relationship with our Office of Human Resources, and this is the air, that is the area that can address this concern. And we will definitely have that conversation with them and give you and the rest of our colleagues some answers in regards to that. But once again, thank you for for hey, telling. Uh, 
This Matt. is Christina oh. with HR, yes. actually. Woo! Hey, and and um, look how great of a relationship we are. She's thinking. We've got she's an thinking. amazing relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead. And you know what? I'm actually, um, we actually just had a posting up last week for an assistant director for HR. And um, about, I want to say, oh my God, you're going to call me a liar, six weeks, uh, eight weeks ago another one for a student employment coordinator and those were both um basically with open positions so um we do try whenever possible because then we've got an hr office in brownsville we've got hr representation in harlington and in, in edinburgh so i mean we do try to open up as possible as much as possible on all campuses and all locations oh undoubtedly ma'am but if i go right now into the career side, which I tend to do probably once a month, 17 jobs are open in Edinburgh and, and that I might even qualify for. And, and you maybe know what? five and maybe director. five and, and I, I, assistant director. I don't even know if I would be able to qualify for that because this I'm, I'm, I'm probably looking for because I, you know, for a, just an HR rep because assistant director asks for more qualifications than I would have. Well, um, and you know what I would strongly recommend? Since, I mean, and this is actually, this goes across the board. If you are interested in new positions, whatever is coming up at the university, um, we actually have interest cards on uh, people admin. And basically what you do is with your email address, you sign up and every time we post a job that is related to HR, that is uh, related to an area that you're interested in accounting, student success, will actually um, send you an email. The system automatically triggers the email as soon as we post the job and you'll get the notification saying, hey, there, there's an HR rep, there's an accountant one, please go ahead and, and check it out. Because actually over the last year, um, we have seen so many people applying and so many really ama truly amazing applicants who were impacted by the pandemic. So it's actually been, hard and easy to fill positions hard because i mean we see amazing applications people with great um backgrounds and experience and education and um you have to make that choice and then easy because i mean you you open something up and and people are coming and um we really truly encourage everybody to consider what's that, all what's that tool again i'm sorry what's it called it's called an interest card and um i know angie is on the call so if you can um can we put a snapshot on? Yeah, let me, the, let me get that real quick. It's basically on the left hand side. Um, whenever, wherever you're applying within People Admin, and it, it lets you pick and choose. So if you want to be um, considered for a faculty, for a lecturer position, for so basically you go in there and you pick and choose what you want to be notified um, about. And once um, you you switch careers and been in a new been hired into a new job you can turn it off until you're ready to start looking again and then you'll turn it back on it, it is really user friendly so that's in the careers uh mm -hmm. website and then yes. under people admin yes you log on to uh people admin if you already have your um your login set up then you would go ahead and uh, log in there and uh, set it up like that if um you've never created an application within people admin you can just go ahead and sign up with um your name your email address and then just um choose the the areas you are interested in yeah i wasn't able to like copy the image but uh i did put the careers website that we have and it's going to be labeled as job alerts there you go they renamed it thank yeah, you they so renamed it. <laughs> no problem okay i got that thank you Awesome. Thank you. And um, I wish I, you would have known about this because, yes, we did have uh, an opening right in HR and um, I did have that posted for um, for Browns well, for actually RGV. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't mean to put anybody on the stop on the spot. I just meant last year when I brought it up, I was told it was due to proportionality. And of course, the Edinburgh being the bigger campus and I just didn't think that was a good excuse since we're all one campus. So right. uh, well, proportionality. And I think we've proven that, I mean, we can, we can work from wherever. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for addressing that. 
Thank you. More questions or comments? Anybody More else? Questions or comments? If not, I think we can take a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. Any second? Second. That's nice. Thank you all so much. And that adjourns our meeting. Go ahead, off No, Ellen. <laughs> no, I mean, I, wasn't I supposed to say any debate or discussion three times, right? No, I don't know. <laughs> any debate or discussion? Any debate or discussion? Any debate or discussion? All right, we get to give you guys about 40 minutes of your time this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Staff Senators, I'll see you tomorrow morning for our closed session. You all take care, be safe out there. Thanks again. <laughs>